welcome everybody for coming. My name is Adam Rizelman. I am a third year PhD student on the Bioinformatics and Integrative Genomics PhD program here at Harvard University. And tonight I'll be talking about big data with my friends Rebecca Fine and Chamath Fonseca. Um, before we start, oh wait, it's not clicking. Hmm. Yeah, do you want to, sorry. Technical difficulties. No. Okay. So, before we get started, I'd like to say something that you all like to hear, but you are valuable. I believe sincerely that each and every one of you are valuable, but that's not what I mean quite yet for this talk. What I'd like to say is that your data is valuable. I know all of you spend a lot of time concern about the things you buy, the money you spent, and where you spend that money. Private organizations and companies are aggregating this data and you're spending decisions, recording it, and processing it to give you targeted ads and product placement for the things that you want to buy. So, for example, Let's take your cell phone, something that's you know, probably sitting in your pocket right now. So this cell phone has you know, the, the phone numbers of all the people that you contact. It has text messages that say who you contacted, what you said, when you contacted them. It has apps that might have your credit card information or other browsing history or other really important information as well as your location at any given time that about every couple seconds is talking to some, a couple cell phone towers in the area. So, you know, these, these companies are using many private organizations as well as the government can record this data, aggregate it, and really come up with a profile of you. And speaking of you, you are also big data. The genetic instruction book is three billion base pairs of DNA. That's really the instruction book that makes you, you. These are the instructions to you, and this really is the idea of big data. So what do all of these things have in common? We can now take measurements of so many different things in this world. And now we have the ability to organize, store, and process this information. And this is where we come up the, with the idea of big data, is really this, this explosion in our ability to organize, store, and process this information. So, on the roadmap to big data, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the history and background of big data. So, how did we get to the idea of big data? What does that even mean, big data? So, what is data? And or, how big are we talking? As well as some um, historical and modern computing techniques that are, are being done in the field right now. Rebecca will talk about some algorithms, so under the hood, how some of these things work. And Chamath will talk about, going forward, what our future in big data looks like and what policies and um, other algorithms are really around the corner that we're going to have to deal with. So, a brief history of data. I think it's, it's first good to kind of come up with, like, what is this broad concept of data? And so data is just facts or descriptions of really anything that can be measured. They're, um, you know, so I think, I think a kind of a concrete way to think about this is to come up with some examples. So one idea I mentioned is some phone records. So, you know, m many of you will get like your phone bill at the end of the month. And, you know, these constantly have like a, a, just a giant stream of the numbers you contacted, when you contacted them, how long these calls lasted, whether they went in or out, and many times the locations of these calls. You know, this is something that's all stored and processed by a phone company. And it's kept and it's something that's easy easily recorded. Um, another um, idea of this big data is DNA. So I talked again about these three billion base pairs of DNA. This is just a small snippet of it, and it's just this amalgamation of C's, T's, A's, and G's. So when we think about how big this actually is, if you took the human genome and you printed it out in books, those letters would fill up a bookshelf. So when we're talking about kind of projects managing big data with regards to, you know, really the information that, that makes up you, it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot of letters and numbers. 
So what does this data look like? We need to break it down into a form that computers can use. So this is just little pulses of electricity that computers can natively read in with their circuits. And these are ones and zeros on and off. And this is binary. This is the bits of the computer, the ones and zeros that are binary. So for example, um, we can look at the letter A, for example. Now a computer, you know, if, if we look at the letter A, we can kind of see, oh, this stroke means, you know, the first letter of the alphabet. But a computer can't read in an A. That's kind of like a human concept of like writing it down and entering it to something like on a piece of paper on the computer. So how does the computer take in that information into the little pulses of electricity of ones and zeros? So you can kind of have a trans, you have a translation table that will break down letters into a computable readable format. So for this, you can take an A and break it down into the little pulses of electricity, the 01, 00001. Um, you can do this for larger, um, more, you know, like larger pieces of text. So for example, beep boop, I'm a robot, will be broken down into these ones and zeros that can be represented and processed on the computer. So how do we process this data? So now we can take in things as big as bookshelves and to process, um, to, you know, like handle that amount of data. But how do we process it? So first, I'd like to introduce the concept of an algorithm. And an algorithm is simply just um, a fancy word for a recipe from getting some input to some output. We have some data, like the human genome or like the cell phone data I talked about before. Um, we want to process it in some way to get some output. Um, another, oh, another word that's useful is a variable. So in that algorithm, if we're, say, making a cake, you know, I have this recipe book that will tell me to add these ingredients in a certain way to make a cake. Now, I can think of a lot of different ingredients to put in cake that may or may not make a cake, but if I follow this recipe and, you know, place these ingredients or the variables um, as the recipe tells me, I get my cake, which is great. So how do we get the computer to run an algorithm on this data? So we have an algorithm, we have something, something we want to do with the data, we have, we have a place to put the data and to process it. How do we get the computer um, to run that algorithm on the data? So you can think of these code books as like uh, a recipe book, it's like these algorithms as just a recipe book for um, how we process data. And so some like an interesting history of this is that um, the original way that computers worked were with punch cards. Now this was um, around like the 1940s and 1950s. And you can see here, um, if you look closely at the card, they have little numbers that are punched out of this um, out of the punch card. And so they had these really big computers that would, um, that read in these punch cards. And so these would, the computer would read these in, and then that would be the way for the human to interact with the computer to tell the bits to go one way or another. Um, and so this computer is the Harvard Mark I. So if you're interested, it's in the Science Center um, on Harvard, Harvard's main campus. Um, and so something like an uh, interesting historical note, um, many of you have maybe on the computer every once in a while, like you type something into Windows or something and it spits out like some, some error or some bug. So the term a computer bug actually, or a code bug actually came from a real bug being stuck in one of these punch cards. So um, Grace Hopper, one of the original people, um, original women that um, developed computer algorithms, um, there was something wrong with their code. There was something wrong with the punch cards. They went through it and a moth, that moth was stuck in one of the holes. And so this was the first time a computer bug was ever recorded. And the name just kind of stuck around from there. So that was, you know, that was then, that was how you stored and processed data. But now um, we've gotten a lot better and a lot faster at processing this data. So um, all hard drives now usually have either um, a magnetic disk, that's your hard drive, and um, the other one is kind of flash drives. So these like really tiny things that you can plug into the computers that have, that can store data. Um, and so just um, to kind of put into scale how much information I can fit onto this little thing in my hand right now, this is a 32 gigabyte um, jump drive or flash drive. So like standard one that you could go, I picked this one up at um, Office Max the other day. Um, so that is then 8 billion ones and zeros that I can fit 
onto the palm of my hand, which is like kind of crazy to think that I can fit it real here, real tiny. Um, and so this was five to ten dollars, you know. So it's you know it's pretty economic for us to throw tons of information on this little thing right here. Um, and so that's 42 copies of my genome. So that three billion base pairs of DNA that I can fit in the palm of my hand. So for scale, back to that, that bookcase, I can fit 42 copies of this bookcase and just hold it, hold it in the palm of my hand. And that's you know, like a really exciting time that we're getting to into computing. So some, some ideas of processing, so we can store data, we have algorithms, but now we need something to do with it. Now we need to process this information into a usable form, you know, so we can make inferences from it. So um, modern computing has become much, much faster than you know, just putting a punch card in and slowly um, you know, get, getting some, um, quick, um, some result out of it. But it's usually done by a divide and conquer approach. Um, so this is known as parallel computing. So this is like your Samsung, um, Samsung Galaxy. This is, um, has a parallel computer inside of it. And so many of you in your pocket have a parallel computer. Um, so uh, non-parallel computing can be brought back to our idea of a recipe or an algorithm. So if I'm if I'm making a cake, you know what I would do is I preheat the oven, then I you know like mix my ingredients, and then I grease the pan, put all the ingredients together, bake it, and then I would get my output. And that's non-parallel computing. But you know, say if I had something to do that day and I was kind of busy, I would you know maybe I'll recruit some of my friends and family to um, help me bake the cake. So maybe I'll have person A preheat the oven, person two mix the ingredients, person three grease the pan. All these things are done in parallel, and that's really kind of the idea of parallel computing. So on um, a computer, this is known as a core, not like an Apple core, but a um, computing core. And so each of these processes is done on a computing core. So this this phone right here is a four core computer. So there are four processors that can you know calc do calculations at one given time. So um, each, each bit of the algorithm is just broken down onto each of these cores, just like a recipe can be broken up um, to divide and conquer and to produce a result. So dealing with big data requires a lot of small tasks. So imagine I'm on the internet and I want to find something. I, you know, I want to find something useful. Like maybe, for example, I, there was a cat picture I saw the other day that I, I you know, I, I, I love cats and I just wanted to find this cat picture again. So um, maybe you want to find that cat picture on the internet. But as you can imagine, the internet is a really big place. So you know, if I just had one person search the internet, it would take a really long time to go through, you know, pretty much to scour the internet to find that picture of the cat. However, in like in a, one example of a parallel computing task is now I can have multiple instances where I look for this cat, and what do you know? It's right there. So in a more pictorial form, um, in a single core computing, say if I, I'm trying to turn um, some input to an output and I have only one processor or one core, um, it, it'll take some time to crank through the data. But in a multi-processing scheme, I can go through it a lot faster. But what kind of problems, you know, like why do we need, you know, big processing um, schemes to get these things completed? Um, and so like, you know, why, why do we need this? What's the point? Um, so one example is um, telescopes. So, you know, like the Hubble telescope and other telescopes are always pointed up at the sky. And there are billions of, you know, of, of separate galaxies and stars and planets to explore. How do we look at all of those galaxies and all of those planets and all of those stars. It's going to take a really long time if we have one computer or one person looking at each and every one, making a decision whether it's important or not. Um, so it would be better if we could, you know, like split up this task. Like somebody look at this part of the computer, somebody look at these stars, somebody look at these stars, somebody look at these stars to find out if we have something interesting. Um, another um, example of this is the Large Hadron Collider. Um, this was in the news a couple months ago um, where it's, it's like a huge physics experiment that's being done in, um, in Europe. And so it's a discovery of some um, fun physics particles. But um, every, ex like, so every year this, um, um, the experiment generates one million of these jump drives worth of data. So just, just these experiments just crank out you know, tons of data and somebody needs to process it. So you need this parallel processing. 
So um, how big can parallel processing and like kind of computing get? Um, so I, am, I have a work for the Department of Energy as well as with the grad school. And so something that the um, US Department of Energy has been pushing is the um, exascale computing initiative. So many of you may be wondering the exo, you know, exascale, exo what? What does that exactly mean? And so I was kind of confused by that until um, someone put that into scale for me. So we have one quintillion calculations per second, or 1.0 times 10 to the 18th of these calculations. So you're essentially adding those numbers every single second. So I think it's, it's hard to get the scale of exascale computing. So one way to break it down is that imagine I have the population of India, which is roughly about a billion people. Now I take one billion uh, of, the, of the population of India, so a billion, billion people, and then everybody in those copies of, of that entire nation does a calculation every single second. That is exascale computing. So you can imagine if you're running a program, this, 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 this number of calculations is done you know, in, in a minute. It does like, you know, really an unfathomably large number of calculations. And that is just you know, really, really exciting to me, honestly. Um, so to summarize, um, we now have the ability to store and process this data. Um, but in many things that we do have a data footprint, so either whether it be your phone or experiments or um, advertising or just browsing the internet, you know, this is natively producing a digital output. And, you know, we need to have some sort of meaningful inferences. We need to develop algorithms to process this data. So um, Rebecca will be talking about how we, these algorithms deal with data. But first, I'd like to see if anybody has any questions. Sure, yes. Um, uh, there is something named quantum computing right now. Yeah. Is that, um, is that X uh, something you talk about? Is, uh, is there any relation with the quantum computer? Because the quantum computer, I was told you that you, you can break some like, um, encryption, very hard encryption. And the other question is, where do you store the information? Sure. Yeah. So the first question was, um, how, what is the relation with quantum computing? So I don't know the the nitty gritty of how quantum computing, like the real the physics behind it, but um, my understanding of um, quantum computing relative to traditional computing. So before I talked about bits, these kind of things that are on and off, ones and zeros. So um, a quantum computer uses um, some of the some of the ideas of relativistic physics of um, of, of, of quantum physics. So you, when you start entering the really, really subatomic scale of atoms, physics starts acting really, really weird. S which is, it, it's so counterintuitive, but instead of, you, we can think that like, okay, so this, this um, jump drive either exists or it doesn't exist. It's a one or a zero, just like in a traditional binary sense. But in a quantum computing, we're talking, what, what it actually is, is a spin of an electron and so it's either, um, it can be in a superposition of, or it can be in a, it can be many positions at once, which is really hard to kind of comprehend. But um, instead of taking one bit, either a one or a zero, it can now expand the number of, um, it can, it, it, it Hmm. Let me. Let's see. <laughs> the physics, the physics, the, the like the quantum computing world is it, it, it's just so weird. But um, but um, it expands relatively the number of bits. So in, essentially, instead of being a one or a zero, it can be um, it can do sixteen calculations at once or thirty two calculations at once. And relative to you know your encryption of those is that for the idea of quantum or for regular computing, it would so for encryption you need to essentially lock down and like. So you would need to do essentially an infinite number of um, computing steps to kind of like find the key that opens the lock, which would be encryption. So with quantum computing, what you can essentially do is try all of them at once, and then once it finds the output, 
it will say, oh, I broke, I broke the um, encryption, and it'll be open. So this idea of like kind of encryption is kind of, you know, it's really scary. Um, so the, the second thing that you mentioned, which um, with like data storage and or cloud computing, um, I think this has really kind of been the advent, or it came around with, you know, the internet. So, um, you know, it's many times it's cheaper to instead, you know, just having a jump drive that I carry around or a hard drive on a computer. It's easier for some data center, you know, maybe in Oregon somewhere that can have, you know, just a giant room or like, you know, kind of like a barn full of servers. And so instead of everybody buying one jump drive, you can have a company that will have, you know, rooms and rooms full of servers that are made to store data, you know, and they're nice, cool, nice and cold and cool, and they're connected to the internet. So, um, so for what I do, and um, I know Rebecca and Chamath do for their work, is that you can um, you essentially use the internet to talk to that server. The response time is, you know, it's like instant. It's like, you know, it's sitting right next to you. And that can store the data for a long term. And it's, you know, maybe cents on the gigabyte relative to actually buying it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, please look up the quantum computing stuff. It can, it's kind of like it's a whole other world, and I, I don't think I'm doing it justice. I, I know that. Oh <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. You uh, describe an algorithm. What I've always thought of as a program. Uh, is there a difference, or is it just your use of the term algorithm? Um, I think you're yeah. Um, so the question was: Is the um, what is the difference between an algorithm and a program? It, that's um, kind of one way to frame it. And I'd say, um, so an algorithm would just be, um, they're essentially the same. It's, it's mainly semantics. But an algorithm is, a, like I, how I would classify it as an algorithm is just a way to solve a problem. And a program is something where it's like a deliverable, i.e., you know, like Microsoft will like hand you Word or like, you know, like some like Office or Excel or some other program. But a, a program really is instructions Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it's it's mainly yeah, semantics, I agree. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, great, thank you. everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Fine. I'm a G3, or third year, uh, in the Biological and Biomedical Sciences graduate program. Um, and I'm going to talk uh, about um, sort of the next, I think, logical step after what Adam was discussing and give you a little bit more of an idea of the nitty gritty of how algorithms work and what they are, uh, and really very importantly, the kinds of issues um, that we end up having to deal with um, when we're looking at data of this size. So I'm going to start by giving you some background on the particular example that I'm going to be using to illustrate these concepts, um, which is something that I, I hope you'll all find interesting. Uh, and that example is online dating. So let's say we have this random person uh, whose name happens to be Rachel. Uh, and Rachel uh, really wants to find a boyfriend. Um, but Rachel doesn't want to do this, uh, this sort of traditional way where you go to a bar and you go to a party and you try to meet someone. Um, she's too busy for that. She would rather uh, sort of 
do it the uh, the more new the new the newfangled way, which is basically going on a website and saying, "Website, here is my information. I want to date someone. Deliver unto me a person who you think that I would be well matched with," uh, and that is what she does. So in this case, uh, Rachel sets up a profile on OkCupid, which is the particular uh, online dating uh, website that I'm going to be discussing. Um, so just to sort of familiarize you with what online dating kind of looks like, this is a typical OkCupid profile. Um, you'll see she has her picture, she has her username, uh, and she writes down a bunch of stuff about herself. This is who I am. Uh, basic sort of self-summary. Um, but it actually, the sort of crux of the way that OkCupid works and most online dating sites work um, are match questions. So the idea behind match questions is we need to get at your personality to figure out who you would be compatible with. So we're going to ask you a bunch of questions about yourself. You're going to answer them. And then everybody else on the website is going to answer those questions. And we're going to use that to predict your compatibility with other people. So just so you get a sense of what this looks like, um, this is an example of a match question in OkCupid. Um, have you smoked a cigarette in the last six months? Oh, so you can see you can answer the question. It also asks you what question you would want to see in a partner. Um, and you also rank the importance of that question to you. Um, and just to give you, a, you know, sort of a little bit more of the idea of the scope and the breadth of this, um, other examples would be, do you believe in God? Do you enjoy discussing politics? And could you date someone who was really messy? So Rachel goes and answers a bunch of these questions, and she gets a bunch of predictions <laughs> for who she would be well matched with. And just to sort of show you three totally random and arbitrary people uh, who uh, this website is finding for her, um, you'll see uh, here are three different profiles. Um, and at the bottom, um, you will see a match percentage, so 75, 52, 83. Um, and this is what the website predicts uh, would be her level of compatibility with each of those three people. So let's sort of take a step back for a minute and talk very fundamentally about what sites like OkCupid are trying to do. They're trying to break down a question which is extremely complicated, uh, and that is the problem of human attraction, and turn it into something that a computer can try to solve, and break it down into sort of the ones and zeros that uh, Adam was discussing earlier. And the way that it does that is by gathering all of these data points about you, which in this case take the form of these match questions, and gathering similar data points about all these other people and trying to use those to predict compatibility. So uh, to give you an idea of when I say, OK, Cupid is big data, how big am I talking? I am talking really big. Because of, as of 2011, OK, Cupid had 275,000 different match questions. So those are the questions like, do you believe in God? And actually, about 776 million answers. So this is an absolutely gigantic and really, really cool data set um, that I think is a, is a really good uh, choice to kind of illustrate uh, the principles of big data that we need to think about um, while sort of showing you the cool things we can learn from stuff like this. So I'm going to use that actually as a springboard now to talk about algorithms. Um, and uh, I'm specifically going to describe to you the algorithm that OkCupid uses um, to give you a better idea of what we're really talking about when we use that word. So as Adam has already uh, described to you, an algorithm is just a, a fancy word for a recipe from going from input to output. So your input is your ingredients, your output is your cake. So the OkCupid site is trying to answer a very specific problem. And that problem is, given a particular user, who do we think would be a good match for that person? Um, and so if I can draw your attention again to these input and output boxes, the input is now user's question answers. And the output is now your prediction of your match compatibility with another person. So let's break that down and really talk about what this algorithm actually looks like. So Rachel wants to know, uh, remember our, our hypothetical user, Rachel. Rachel wants to know how well matched is, is she with this other user, Ross. So OK, let's break this down. The three components of, uh, of sort of the input here, which is the, the user's question answers box. So we start with what answer for a particular question does Rachel actually want to see? What is it that she, for this particular, uh, for this particular variable, what does she want to see um, in, a, in a potential boyfriend? The second piece is how important is that question to Rachel? Um, and this is actually a very, this is a critical subtlety 
because um, you can imagine that that not all questions are are sort of created equal in this way, right? There might be some things that are deal breakers for Rachel. There are other things that she really might not care about very much at all, and then there are a lot of things in between. So it's important to factor that in uh, to how this algorithm is going to work. Um, and finally, of course, we have what answer did Ross actually give? So given this question, what did Ross actually say? So this importance piece of it um, actually turns out to be quite critical to the overall uh, way that this algorithm is structured. Uh, and basically, the way it works is that the answer to that question determines uh, how many points that question is worth. So uh, Rachel can rate a question as being irrelevant, a little important, somewhat important, very important, or mandatory. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the point value is then assigned commensurate with uh, what, she, what she said about that and then that question is worth that particular number of points. So let's make this a little bit more concrete with an example. Do you like to watch sports on television? So Rachel would like a partner who says, uh, says yes because Rachel loves watching sports on television and in fact this question is very important to her. Because uh, for Rachel, a critical part of the relationship is being able to sit on the couch and watch football with her boyfriend. So what answer did Ross actually give? Ross says yes. Uh, so Ross does enjoy watching sports on television, which means that relative to Rachel, he has gotten that answer correct. So how do we turn that into numbers? Uh, well, the question was worth 50 points because it was very important. Uh, and Ross has gotten it right, so he gets 50 out of 50 possible points. Let's try another one. For a random question, would speaking in front of a large group make you nervous? So this time, Rachel wants the answer no. Uh, Rachel would prefer to date someone who isn't nervous, speaking in front of a large crowd. Um, but this question is less important to her. It's only somewhat important. Uh, and this time, Ross gets it wrong, because Ross says that he will actually get nervous speaking in front of a large crowd. So now this question is worth 10 points because this question was only somewhat important, but since he's gotten it wrong, that is now zero points. So the sort of overall calculation now is how do we have to, how do we combine those two sets of points? Uh, so we have 50 points for a question that was very important and 10 points for a question that was somewhat important. So that's the possible total number of points. The actual number of points scored uh, were 50 and zero because, uh, because Ross got the first question right and the second question wrong. And so the total match percentage is 50, which is the number of points that Ross actually scored, divided by 60, which is the number of points that Ross could possibly get. And that gives 0.83 or a match percentage of 83%. Now this is of course a simplification because the process has to work both ways for you know how compatible is Ross for Rachel versus how compatible Rachel is for Ross. Um, but that's uh, the pretty the, the basic framework of how this works, um, and because that that might have been uh, sort of unfamiliar to a lot of you, I'm just actually going to take a quick break and answer any questions that anyone has at this point before I go back. Yes. Mm-hmm. So the question was, um, of those, what exactly do I mean when it says 275,000 questions? Um, I actually believe that that's the number of different questions that you can answer on the site, at least as of 2011, um, because I think they're user submitted, or at least some of them are user submitted, which is what allows it you know, to become such a, an insanely large number. So obviously nobody on OkCupid is actually answering 275,000 questions. Uh, they're answering a subset of those. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, and I'm going to be talking about the relationships between some of those questions uh, in probably about 10 minutes. Other questions? Okay, great. So I'm going to start now by asking you all some questions because I think we should get to know each other better. So the first question that I want to ask you is, do you like horror movies? If you like horror movies, raise your hand. Okay, if you don't, raise your hand. All right, great. The second question is, have you ever traveled around another country alone? If you have, raise your hand. If you haven't, raise your hand. Awesome. And the third question is, wouldn't it be fun to chuck it all and go live on a sailboat? If you think yes, raise your hand. 
<laughs> Interesting. No raise your hand. All right. So I'm going to put a pin in that and come back to that in probably about three minutes. Uh, so then I'm going to be spending this next bit of the talk talking about predictions. So I'm actually going to start by defining a term that's going to be very important to this second piece of my talk. And that term, which I'm sure most of you have heard before, is correlation. But just to make sure that we're all on the same page, um, when I say correlation, I mean uh, how much do two quantities change together? So for example, here is a plot of temperature and ice cream consumption. You can see that as the temperature gets higher, ice cream consumption also gets higher, which is something that makes a lot of sense. So each of these points uh, is showing that as you know at this particular temperature this is how much ice cream is consumed uh, and in fact if I were to draw a line that I think best explains that data or a line that best captures the overall shape of those points that would be this diagonal line. So I would say that uh, these are two quantities that are correlated. So temperature and the amount of ice cream consumed are correlated. But if we look instead at temperature and something like pizza consumption, uh, we see that immediately it's, uh, there, there is no obvious trend anymore, and the amount of pizza consumed doesn't seem to depend at all very much on temperature. And if I were to draw a line to, again, try to capture this relationship, I would get this flat, horizontal, not very exciting looking line. Uh, and so this is something that I would say is uncorrelated. So when I refer to things being correlated for the rest of this talk, this is what I'm referring to. Okay, so let's talk about predictive power. How do we determine what data is useful? And when I say useful, I, I'm sort of using useful and predictive interchangeably. When I say that, I really mean data that correlates well with outcome. So not all questions are actually going to predict what we're interested in, which is are people going to end up in a couple, right? Some questions are going to do a good job at predicting whether people are going to end up in a couple. Some questions are going to do a bad job at predicting that. Um, and it might sort of be interesting to dig into this data set and see which questions fall into which category. So to make that more concrete, a question that I think is likely useful or predictive is do you believe contraception is morally wrong? Because this is the kind of question that if a couple uh, disagrees on this, that could provide that could that could create really fundamental problems uh, for that for that relationship. Um, on the other hand, the question "Are you ticklish?" Uh, is probably not so useful because while it's a fun fact to, to know about someone, it really doesn't tell you very much about the compatibility or likely compatibility of two people. So to sort of frame this more visually. We have these hundreds of thousands of questions from OkCupid. Okay um, we want to predict, are people going to end up in a couple or not end up in a couple? And the question really is, do we need all of these hundreds of thousands of questions, or is a lot of the information in those questions redundant? And further, are a lot, is, is, are a lot of those questions actually just not predictive at all, not correlated at all with whether people end up in a couple? So what we want to do is get from what I just showed you to what I'm showing you now, which is that we've collapsed these hundreds of thousands of questions into a handful that seem to do most of the work in accurately predicting whether people end up in a couple. So how do we answer a question like that? And this is the kind of question that data scientists actually have to grapple with all the time, is trying to figure out which of their data is the most interesting and important. So what you actually need is data where we have both the predictors and the outcome. And so in this case, the predictors would be the answers to the questions, and the outcome would be people who actually became couples. And it turns out that OkCupid actually has this data, because uh, one of the things you can do when you leave the website is say, I'm leaving the website because I, I have entered into a relationship with somebody else on OkCupid and provide them that person's username. So if, based on this, OkCupid was able to collect uh, a database of about 30,000 couples, which is massive. And of course, they had the question answers that, that, that each member of, of those couples had provided before, uh, before they actually got together. So we can actually look at that data set and answer this question about which, which, uh, which data points are the most predictive. Uh, and that brings me back um, to these three questions. Do you like horror movies? Have you ever traveled around another country alone? And wouldn't it be fun to chuck it all and go live on a sailboat? 
So this is, these are three questions that, that we could consider as, you know, how predictive are, are, are these of whether people end up in a couple? How often do members of a couple agree on the answers to these questions? Um, I'm going to actually present you with an alternative set of questions. Uh, is God important in your life? Is physical intimacy the most important part of a relationship? And does smoking disgust you? Um, and I'm actually going to ask you now, which of those two sets of questions do you think couples are more likely to agree on in this data set? So if you think that the first set of questions is going to be more predictive, raise your hand. Okay, if you think the second set, raise your hand. Well, it turns out I got you because as a matter of fact, the first set of questions is substantially more predictive than the second set of questions. So the first set of questions, this is the percentage of couples who agreed on all three questions. Of all of the questions in uh, their database that they determined were acceptable to ask on a first date, uh, those three questions were the, most, uh, were the most likely for couples to agree on, it's about 32%, um, which is three to four times uh, more likely than what you would expect by chance versus the second set, which seems like it would be more predictive, um, but actually people only agreed on about 14% of the time. So it's still more than chance, but uh, nowhere, nowhere uh, close to this um, more predictive set of questions. Um, so that's pretty interesting. And I think that a lot of us are going to want to draw some really possibly wild conclusions about human nature um, on the basis of, of this finding. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to kill your party because I don't think we can do that. And I want to talk to you about the reasons that we have to be very careful about interpreting these kinds of really interesting uh, relationships. Um, and that brings me to this section, my last section on correlation. Um, so you'll remember that correlation uh, is just assessing the relationship between two variables. Um, and so many of questions of these hundreds of thousands of questions are correlated. And by that, I mean the answer to one question um, predicts the answer to the other question. So obviously, many questions are correlated because they assess a similar trait. So for example, should evolution and creationism be taught side by side in schools? And do you put more weight in science or in faith? Those are questions that we would expect would be highly correlated to each other because they're both measures of religiosity. They're both measures of how religious someone is. So that's no surprise. That's just redundancy in a lot of ways. Um, but the other thing that happens, and it happens a lot, is that questions are correlated, and the reason they're correlated is actually that they reflect a third variable. What is a third variable? So if you have two, uh, two things, two variables, that are correlated to each other, uh, it might actually be that there is a third variable, another thing, that maybe you, you haven't measured or you can't observe, and that thing is affecting each of your other variables, um, but you don't know about it because you're not measuring it or you're not checking it against these other variables, and therefore or it appears as though there is a relationship between these two, uh, two variables that you were looking at originally, and they are correlated to each other, but only because of their independent relationship with this third thing uh, that you don't necessarily have access to. So for an example, uh, these two questions, have you ever traveled outside the country? And have you ever seen a therapist? Those are questions that I would say uh, seem like pretty good OkCupid okay questions. Uh, they, seem, they seem pretty interesting and, and helpful, possibly. Um, but I would argue, and I, and I don't think this detracts from whether they're useful or not, but I would argue that uh, these questions are very likely to be correlated to each other. And the reason is not because there's anything obvious about why these two things should be, should be causally related to each other, um, but actually because they both reflect socioeconomic status. It's extremely difficult to travel outside the country or to see a therapist if you don't have money. And so this is the kind of thing that happens across data sets all the time. There are these hidden things that are affecting the, the measured outcomes that you have, uh, and that really hinders our ability to draw strong conclusions uh, about our data. So that brings me to this point, which is data scientists' favorite thing to say, which is correlation does not imply causation. If you have a good predictor, or in this case a question, that's good at predicting whether people are going to be in a couple, that predictor can be good because it's actually causal, it's actually responsible for why people are compatible, or it might reflect another variable that's causal that you can't see. And the really critical point, if you take nothing else from anything I tell you today, is that it is extremely difficult to tell the difference between those two situations, sometimes impossible, and frankly, more often than not, impossible. 
So to wrap up with an example of, of how this is true, here are four questions. Uh, should burning your country's flag be illegal? Should gay marriage be legal? Should the death penalty be abolished? And should evolution and creationism be taught side by side in schools? These are all questions that we would all expect to be highly correlated because, of course, they all, they, they all reflect your political and religious views. That's no surprise. But when OKCupid uh, decided to do an analysis where they said, OK, let's look at these questions that we've decided are acceptable to ask on a first date, when they looked at those questions and said, which of those is the most predictive of your answer to these other four, it turns out that that question is, do you prefer the people in your life to be simple or complex? Uh, and this was a pretty strong relationship um, to the tune of, if you prefer simplicity, you're 65 to 70% more likely to be conservative. And if you prefer complexity, you're 65 to 70% more likely to be liberal. And this is a situation where I, I, I would imagine it's evident to most of you that the direction of causality is not clear at all. Because you can imagine that preferring people in your life to be a certain way causes you to have certain political or religious views, you can imagine that having certain political and religious views then shapes how you feel about the people in your life. Or, as I would argue is probably the most likely, it goes in both directions, and both of those things really shape each other. Uh, which means that as much as we want to draw all these awesome and exciting conclusions about this, uh, we have to be very, very cautious about that. Because we have no idea what other things are going on in this data set or not in this data set that we can't see. So just to recap uh, these lessons that I, I hope I've imparted to you, um, that algorithms can be an effective tool for using data. Uh, not all variables are created equal. Some are more predictive than others. Some do a lot more of the work in predicting outcomes. And just because uh, a variable is predictive doesn't mean we understand why it's predictive. And that's because correlation does not imply causation. Uh, and I am happy to take any questions now. Questions? I had a question, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I would say, more than question is, how is that we have all this amount of data and all this technology, and yesterday, with elections, <laughs> that we have a really, nobody was expecting the result. Just, it's very interesting. Oh, so the question was, is how is it that we can have all of these amazing uh, models uh, and sources of data and we can't accurately predict things like the outcome of an election? Um, and I would actually say the answer to that is going to be somewhat addressed by Chamath in the next section because he's going to be talking about the limitations of big data. So there's a lot of issues with you can measure all of the things that you want, but if you're not measuring the right thing, then you're, there's no way that your data is going to accurately predict an outcome. Uh, and so uh, I think that it, there's, there's a tendency for us to see big data as this panacea, where if we collect enough information, we'll be able to predict anything. And unfortunately, that's just not the case, uh, because there are human biases involved. Uh, and just a lot of, uh, and frankly, a lot of issues with collecting data, because we can't collect you know, all the data in the world. It's not possible. So I hope that answers your question, even though it, I sort of sounded vaguely rhetorical. <laughs> So the, the question is, um, is it ever a problem when people have difficulty deciding between if there's just you know a yes or no possible answer? Uh, right. So wh whether there's um, if there's only these two choices and people don't necessarily feel strongly that they're one or the other, you know, how does that work? Um, so I mean, the, the 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 full answer is, of course, you know, I don't work at OkCupid, so I can't. I don't actually know if they have any particular ways of dealing with it. I would say, as a general rule. Uh, one thing is uh, you are allowed to skip questions. So if there's a question that you see that you don't know how to respond to, you don't actually have to answer it. Uh, so that actually probably takes care of some of it, because if it were me, I would avoid answering a question that I, I didn't have a clear answer to. Um, another thing is that uh, 
I think a lot of what we're doing is that because the data is so big and you have so many questions, things like that are supposed to kind of wash out because you're measuring enough data points that if some of them aren't perfectly accurate, you're sort of compensating by the, just the sort of overall volume that you have. Uh, it's hard to say you know, how well that works because these are people and people are really complicated. Um, but that's, that's probably, that, if I had to guess, I would say if you asked someone from OkCupid, that's probably what they, what they would tell you. And of course, you can also mark a question as not being very important, which will then cause the question not to be weighted very highly. To this question, uh, some psychological testing will ask the same question multiple ways, so effectively giving it some context. So they will look at all the answers to basically the same question and determine if, if the person maybe is mixed in, in their answer or they're confirmed in their answer. Yeah, the comment was that there are, um, there are a lot of psychological surveys that will be sort of relating to this problem that he was uh, posing, will ask the same question in multiple ways to sort of evaluate internal consistency and, uh, and things like that, which I think is probably a, a smart move because we like to think we're consistent, but I think that the data probably shows that we are not, so. Uh, 